So let's get started. I'm excited to talk about things which I am already excited. So it's my second time at Force Asia, and uh, this time I'm going to talk about Terraform. And uh, the main idea is uh, I want to bring some points to people who already use Terraform so that uh, you maybe write it a little bit better. Okay, so first of all, a couple of things about myself. Uh, my name is Anton and uh, I live in Norway. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine. Um, Norway is pretty cold compared to Singapore. So we have several meters of snow right now. And uh, uh, over the last uh, few years, I've been actively involved in uh, Terraform, uh, HashiCorp uh, user group activities, AWS user group, DevOps, uh, DevOps days, Oslo organizing, and so on. I enjoy going around uh, different countries and speaking at different meetups and being involved with Terraform and AWS communities. So if you have questions about things which I'm going to present, uh, don't hesitate to contact me uh, using any of these channels. Uh, I can just say a couple words about projects which listed here. Uh, Terraform best practices is something what I started uh, summarizing about half a year ago, and uh, I try to keep this up to date with uh, latest things which I find in the community, and uh, I hope you find it interesting. Uh, also, you can always reach me on Twitter and GitHub uh, to see what I'm up to. Um, before I move to the next slide, let me ask, uh, like, can, can you raise hand if you use Terraform on a daily basis? Like, anyone use Terraform on a daily basis? Nobody. Excellent, because this is a really advanced topic. Okay, so if... Uh, uh, if you have never used Terraform, then uh, I'm afraid that you will be a little bit disappointed because uh, there are a lot of code, a lot of Terraform, and a lot of uh, uh, a little bit complicated things. So, as I understand, no one is using Terraform, which is pretty unusual, but nevertheless, thanks for coming. So, Terraform AWS modules is a project which uh, I started uh, uh, or I actually joined it, but then I adopted it and became main contributor to this um, from uh, about 2015-16. Uh, this is a project where community contributes different Terraform AWS modules in order to build reusable blocks like VPC, security groups, auto-scaling group, and so on. And by the way, uh, who is uh, like familiar with AWS? Uh, can you raise hands? So. Okay, good, good, good. So yeah, it's good because there are a lot of words which I don't really want to explain, like what is RDS, what is security group and so on, because otherwise we will never finish, okay? So uh, this project itself is very uh, useful and was uh, downloaded more than two million times so far. Uh, if you need to build things like VPC, uh, it's unlikely that your case is unique. So don't hesitate to look into those building blocks. So Terraform was started in 2014 as a tool which uh, allows to just write, plan, and uh, manage infrastructure as code. As code means that uh, this infrastructure will be possible to recreate in different configurations, uh, in, let's say, different accounts, different regions, and so on. So this is actually making DevOps uh, movement possible. Terraform configuration file usually looks like this. Uh, in this example, we have a uh, block uh, AWS region where we uh, specify variable. We have a uh, couple of resources which we want to create. And uh, after several commands like Terraform init, we download some dependencies like provider of specified version. And then we run Terraform apply and it will actually uh, create resources which we want. In this case, we are creating uh, S3 bucket. Uh, and we can see the last line is that this bucket has been successfully created. You may think, why Terraform? Why not uh, AWS CloudFormation? Or if you are on Google, why not Google Cloud Deployment Manager? Or if you are even using Azure, uh, Azure Resource Manager? So, and the answer is uh, that Terraform 
has more than 100 other providers in addition to this, which means that it is possible to manage very large amount of different uh, type of resources. It can be uh, your G Suite access, for example, your Dropbox files and access, new relic metrics, data dot permissions, different type of dashboards, uh, whatever else you can figure out. There are enormous amount of providers out there uh, created by the community. So this was basic of Terraform. Now let's get into uh, actually looking what Terraform is and how we actually use it. So let's start with a simple example. In this example, we are creating just a, oops, just a VPC. We specify some properties uh, and that's it. That's all what this example is doing. Then we will figure out that our project will grow. We'll start adding new resources, uh, integrate with different data sources, apply it to different regions and so on. You may think why? Because we also need to integrate with, uh, with other providers. And uh, in this example, we are adding AWS uh, internet gateway resource because we want to go to the internet. And uh, we start to add a couple subnets and by the time when we actually uh, gonna to add other resources like NAT gateways, uh, routes, routing table, our network stack uh, for AWS will look much much more than just 40 lines. And main TF file will eventually grow up to 10, 20 kilobytes and uh, 300 lines of code or more. And we are talking just about network stack, which is basic of uh, everything. Right? We are not even talking about deploying other sophisticated resources like auto scaling group or load balancers, which are necessary for our application. So as we can see, the code size is increasing constantly and uh, dependencies between resources are getting worse and worse and more complicated. And naturally a solution uh, which, is, uh, which has been designed for Terraform is called Terraform modules. So Terraform modules is self-contained package of Terraform configuration, which is managed as a group. There are a few types of uh, Terraform modules. The first one, which is resource module. Yeah, it is a great example of uh, something what can be open sourced and uh, it has no logic uh, building inside of it other than just creating resource in very flexible configuration. And this is an example of security group module, which is just a uh, fetched from specified uh, endpoint. In this case, it is a Terraform registry. And uh, we specify which version of this uh, module we want. And we specify different arguments which we want to pass into this module. So the reason why a resource module uh, is necessary is that it is possible to version it as, as a whole, while individual resources cannot be managed, uh, cannot be versioned. Let's look into a real example of security group module. This is a piece of code of security group module, which may seem very complicated, but in fact, all what it does is just creation of security group, but in enormous amount of con uh, configuration. For example, IPv4, IPv6, self references, computed values, and so on. Uh, there are about uh, five, five or 600 lines uh, in order to create just security groups. You may think that uh, you will not need uh, this kind of situation. It's like, why, why to make it so complicated? And the answer is that if you are working with Terraform, uh, you may know that it's not possible to uh, specify empty values in some, uh, in some arguments. So that's why you need to figure out all possible permutation which will work for your case. In this case, uh, for security group, uh, there are a lot of uh, situations when you cannot specify on one rule both IPv4 and IPv6, so you have to make two resources differently. Right, another type of module is called infrastructure module, which is essentially a composition of resource modules. It's a good place for your company to introduce different naming standards, tagging, or enforce some uh, uh, things which you don't want to be customized by developers or by users of your modules inside of your organization. For example, you want to make 
uh, module uh, which is available across the whole organization where people are not able to turn off uh, encryption. So it doesn't matter if they want it or not, but there is no way for them to turn it off. That's why you have to make an infrastructure module where encryption is always true. It is also a good way to uh, fulfill missing, missing bits of uh, Terraform, like uh, you may use different tools to uh, generate parts of your code using JSONnet or cookie cutter or other type of preprocessors. Infrastructure modules in vacation looks pretty similar. You specify source of the module and you specify a bunch of different arguments which you want to pass to the module. Inside of the module itself, you are invoking different resource modules. That's uh, the main difference uh, between the resource module and infrastructure module. So as a small summary, there are two types of modules which I want to uh, keep uh, as separated as possible. While a lot of people don't feel uh, that this uh, separation is uh, necessary. Resource modules uh, are those which I maintain on Terraform AWS modules, GitHub organization, and the infrastructure module is something what usually people have inside of their organizations for their specific needs. Was it clear so far? Good, because we're getting deeper and deeper. Right, so let's look into how to write modules. Okay, and then we'll look how to call them and some tips of how to actually use Terraform. So the first tip which I want to give about writing resource module is to not write them. Really, go to registry, Terraform registry, which is an uh, uh, official place where you can uh, download and see source code of about 650 uh, AWS modules, for example. And there are lots of other modules for other providers like Google, Azure, and so on. It's maintained, uh, or community can upload their stuff there. Uh, and uh, some of those modules are used by many, many people. Some of them are pretty bad quality, so you, you will have to find something. But anyway, it's usually a very good place to look into and start. Don't go to documentation and start writing it because you think that your case is so unique. Most likely not. If you decided to write Terraform uh, resource module, try to always hide implementation details from your users. You don't have to be expert in specific implementation of RDS, for example, but uh, they just want to specify uh, that they want to have, uh, let's say, a mass SQL or MySQL. And then you, inside of the module, actually figure out what kind of uh, arguments each of these resources may have. For example, in this code, we are creating a mass SQL if, uh, if it was requested, or MySQL or Postgres in other cases. And as you can see, uh, line 14 says that time zone can be specified for MSSQL only, while it's not possible to specify it for other resources uh, like MySQL and Postgres, which is one of type of details which you don't want your uh, users to be experts in. So hide it away from them and the output just first not empty database uh, address which you have. So in this case, it can be either a MSSQL address or any other address. Also, if you work with, uh, uh, if you host your infrastructure modules uh, in one big repository inside of your organization, and you call this module multiple times, for example, if you want to create IAM users, uh, and uh, you have a lot of other infrastructure modules in one organization or in one repository, uh, it will have to be downloaded multiple times. So what it means is uh, Terraform will download the whole um, the whole repository and it will just uh, change the directory to the place where you want it to be. So if you are making, uh, let's say, hundreds of IAM users, you will have to clone repository hundreds of times and use just small subset of this repository, which is a waste of time and uh, traffic. Uh, there are a few solutions. One is to use a project like MBT, where you can build just small artifact for each uh, version module and use th that one. A couple things uh, to avoid inside modules. So 
this is uh, something what uh, I want you to look into and tell what you think is wrong here other than hard-coded value of uh, region. So I can uh, give you a hint. The problem is not on line 1, 2, 3 or 5. So which line has problem? Yes, exactly. And what kind of problem is there? I'm talking about uh, what's wrong with this block in general and why it is wrong for the module. Exactly. So the answer is that if we have different users who want to access uh, or who want to configure access to AWS provider differently, like uh, first guy wants to use default configuration uh, in order to access AWS and another guy wants to use shared credential file, they will not be able to use your block because you uh, expect that they will use assume role. In fact, no, they will not use it. Some of them will use uh, environment variables uh, which are set in the um, machine and some will use shared credential files. So the solution for that one is to not put uh, provider block at all in the module. And second one is provision room, which is very often a bad idea. In this example, we are calling local exec provision after VPC is created. And uh, this block itself is a bad idea. It's actually bad even for AWS instance. So let me explain why it is bad for instance. Uh, you, first of all, let me explain why you think or you may think this is a good idea. Because AWS instance will be created and then provision or local exec will be executed on your machine. So you will call Ansible playbook, you will connect to this newly created instance and you will do whatever is necessary. There will be situation quite soon when this block, uh, this block uh, provision or local exec is not possible to use on launch configuration. So this means that if you start using uh, AWS instance and you put a lot of provisioners there, uh, you cannot use them on uh, launch configuration because the triggering point for launch configuration is not creation of launch configuration itself. It's creation of resources which uh, during auto-scaling activity. So in AWS, user data has been introduced. In other providers, there is some sort of flavor of cloud image. Yeah, yeah. This uh, code shows that this uh, user data will be called on the instance only when instance is started from the instance itself. So it means that operator who actually run uh, Terraform apply, it can be CI or it can be individual users. They don't have to have uh, physical access and always be online in order to uh, execute this. It means that code is already separated from me triggering something and going away from uh, actually running Ansible playbook. If you need to have uh, execution of provisioner, let's say when something is done, you can assign this provisioner to null resource. Null resource is a special type of resource in Terraform, which is actually just null. It's not real resource, resource. it's not physical resource. And this code will be uh, executing uh, AWS CLI when uh, VPC resource is created. This pattern is very common if you need to uh, connect some, uh, if, if you need to actually call some CLI to, let's say, add missing functionality which is not implemented in Terraform. There are a few, few traits of uh, good Terraform modules the way I see them. Uh, first of all, it's very important that Terraform modules are actually documented and contain a lot of examples which people can execute. So if module is also feature rich, which means that it supports not just your specific edge case or your specific problem, but also wide, uh, wide range of uh, similar situations, it's much better. It means that people will most likely use it. Also, don't try to put uh, defaults which are specific for your particular setup. So don't hard code names, uh, numbers, or anything like that. Make it obviously for people to 
uh, require the supplier. And also, and also if your resource is about creation, let's say security group, don't try to make it create security group and also some IAM permission. It's very seldom when you need to combine these things together. So always make them as small as granular as possible. And I put test on the last uh, step here just because I don't believe the testing of resource module is actually meaningful. Because uh, a lot of situations you will see that it works on my machine but doesn't work on your account, on your machine, on your region and so on. So I don't believe so much in testing as uh, in actually showing how it's supposed to be used. And you can read more about this on this URL. So, uh, small summary, uh, we figure out that uh, it's better to not write them because there are a lot of them in the registry and uh, try to avoid providers and provisioners. Most likely you are not gonna need them at all. And if you try to, try to not put them in the module, you'll have your life much, much easier when it comes to reusability of these pieces. So let's look into how to call modules. So uh, first of all, as we can see that uh, over time, the amount of resources and the amount of different uh, moving parts is just increasing. And we start to think how to organize code and how to orchestrate different invocation of the Terraform code. There are two patterns. The first one is uh, all-in-one, is where you have a uh, few uh, files uh, like main TF where you involve um, different infrastructure or resource modules to create different, uh, to create uh, infrastructure you want. So the bad part there is that it obviously has effect on everything. So the scope and the blast radius is large and uh, you will figure out that uh, it's getting pretty hard if you are working on large amount of resources. So in reality, it means that you will have to wait every time when you run Terraform plan for minutes, two, five, ten, it depends on your size of infrastructure. So the, best, the good part here is that you actually have to declare variables in fewer place. And another pattern in which uh, uh, is on another side is one and one is where you have much smaller blast radios and uh, you have to uh, you have to um, describe uh, separate in infrastructure module or resource module as uh, independent as possible um, the good part here is that you will be able to reduce blast radios to just necessary things as in this example, it's also important to realize that you're going to work in these places quite differently. So your VPC is not going to be changing every day or every hour, while your application can change actually quite often by developers. And uh, by separating this, you will have guarantee that you're, um, you're, you're not going to destroy something shared like VPC if you're touching application and so on. So, uh, I'd like to see hands, uh, if you're using Terraform, uh, how do you structure or how do you group your code? So, on one hand, you have all-in-one. Does anyone use all-in-one where you have main TF file and you put everything there? Nobody. Cool. And one-in-one, one. who feel that this is like better? No. Okay, I can tell you that the most frequent answer among people who use Terraform is that somewhere in between. It's very seldom when you need to uh, uh, to stick to one of these because it, it's just uh, unlikely that uh, you will be like starting your day and thinking like, oh, today I'm going to make everything perfect from day one. No, it's not going to be this day. So another type of question which I'd like to uh, emphasize is there are different ways and different needs, uh, different tools to actually orchestrate invocation of these um, bits. Uh, one way is that if you have all in one, where you have invocation of multiple modules, you may use minus target and specify each module separately, or you can use make file to invoke it, um, to, inv to, to chain this invocation. Let's say create 
VPC first and then create instances and so on. So you have to call Terraform apply in different directories. And in Terraform, uh, some people may think that this is a good way to do. This is not a good way to do. That's not really a good way to do. Don't try it at home. While you can call Terraform from Terraform, it was not designed to do that. And uh, I saw some people struggling and thinking that this is not a joke. So when I when I show this slide and some people take photo, I remember their face and then one kitten die. So don't try to do this at home. So Terraform calling from Terraform is not a good idea. In Terraform world there is a Terragrant. Terragrant is a tool which allows to orchestrate invocation of infrastructure modules. As in this example, this is Terragrant. Terragrant is a tool to invoke Terraform. So Terragrant configuration file looks like this, where we specify from which source we want to uh, to get, um, like which module we want to get, and what kind of dependencies does this module have. In this case, we are talking about EC2 instance, which uh, obviously require a network to be present before. And uh, we also need to pass uh, arguments to this module. So in essence, that's all what is Terragram doing. So you have just one configuration file which describe which module uh, you need to use, what it depends to, and what are different arguments. Unfortunately, the force does not contain dynamic values, which means that you will have to somehow provide subnet ID uh, which you fetch from network module and put it here hard coded, which uh, is pretty bad idea. So I fix it using small hook. It is a very like logical way uh, to do things in Terragrant because there are ways to execute before and after hooks on different commands. So I wrote small shell script which is just doing set operation and replace these values. Or you can use models TF, which I will talk a little bit later if I have time. So uh, right now we look into uh, how to call modules. Uh, I can tell you that uh, one in one works much better over time. So if you are hesitant about where to start or like start to uh, increase your code in one file or in one directory, and your Terraform uh, configuration is about 10 kilobytes, then you definitely do something wrong. So try to split it uh, a little bit earlier. You will see benefit in productivity more efficient. So if we, yeah, now let's look how to work with the code. So when we have a requirement to add new features um, to our infrastructure, it's usually easy. But sometimes it makes sense to create new resources or use existing resources conditionally. So, for example, if we want to make a reusable infrastructure module where we get information about uh, VPC ID, if it was present, if it was not present, then we create it. Uh, in this case, we are using data source to find information about existing VPC ID, or we create the one uh, if it was not specified. And we output just the VPC ID back to the user. Working with lists in Terraform 0.11 is not so easy because uh, they always have uh, have index. So in this case, user uh, list of SSH public keys, user one, two, three, and four has uh, has index. Like each element has index, which means that user one is like zero, then one, two, three, and if we want to delete user three. Uh, it means that user 4, who is going after, will have to be deleted and recreated. So for information, uh, like for resources, which uh, like files, it's probably okay because we can delete uh, last element and we'll recreate it. It's totally fine for things like public keys where we delete it and we create it again. While for stateful list, for example, as an example of stateful resource is the AWS IAM access and secret keys, which, which we simply cannot allow 
to be recreated every time because we'll ta every time we'll have new uh, access and secret key for the user. And that's not acceptable in most of cases uh, where user uh, whose name is started with letter Z will have uh, new access and secret key every time when uh, me, because my name starts with letter A, will leave the company, for example. It's simply not acceptable. So there are solutions like uh, involving JSONnet uh, in order to generate uh, templates. So this is an example of uh, JSONnet template. JSONnet uh, is a language by Google which generates uh, JSON from data structures, like just plain JSON uh, list. So this will produce uh, JSON output, and Terraform natively works with both HCL, which is uh, HashiCorp configuration language, and JSON. So this piece of code will produce a valid map of uh, modules and outputs, which will be uh, treated by Terraform natively, and for Terraform it will be absolutely fine to understand this code. So let's look how to involve this. First, uh, if we call JSONnet and we specify which template we want, uh, the output of uh, produced file will look like map of, uh, map of maps. Uh, in this case, we are calling a specific IAM module and we pass different arguments to this module. And then we'll later execute Terraform init and Terraform apply to get this infrastructure, this user created. The benefit here is that uh, if somebody uh, will be removed from the original JSON, uh, JSON input uh, file, uh, the new code will be generated and only this user will be removed. Nobody else will be touched. Another way is to integrate. So if we, if we have created some resources and we want other machine or other script or even other human to be able to get uh, the entire command which uh, can be executed, we can output the entire command and use just reference uh, as in this case web application firewall web ACL and then we can execute it in a uh, uh, shell like this. If we want to execute some of these commands automatically every time when something has changed we can just uh, use null resource and local exec provider again we don't need to use resource aws web firewall and provisioner there because we have to use null resource for that there are many different edge cases when it comes to testing and it works on my machine it works on my account in my project my setup because there are lots of different uh, configurations, uh, things like AWS region can be different. We are not even talking about GovCloud or China, which are always behind and have very different uh, uh, different features available at any point of time. But also publicly available regions in AWS have very different uh, feature set, like EC2 classic link or IPv6 availability. Uh, means that it can work in one account for one user but will not work for another one. Also soft limits is pretty often a problem that uh, certain type of instances or certain type of IP addresses are not available in my account but it can be available in another account. This means that testing anything else uh, like uh, any kind of infrastructure in development or in test environment usually has almost no sense unless you test it in production account with production settings close to production as possible. So things to avoid in Terraform. We have a little, yeah, we have probably a little bit of time, so I'm a little bit hurrying, but it should be a fine in time. So if you have any arguments uh, which you think it's a good idea to specify in CLI, and you will always remember all of this dash var or dash var file, uh, the sequence of them, usually it makes much more sense to put all of them into TFRs files and uh, just include this file e either automatically or uh, using single uh, argument. But don't try to combine all this var, 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 var file and so on because you will simply forget about them very soon.
Also try to not use all of this target parallelism, uh, which gives you a more granular control of what Terraform should be doing. Terraform is smart enough to understand what to do uh, itself just by looking and analyzing your code. Usually Terraform workspaces are evil if you try to manage uh, uh, long-term environments like production, dev, testing, and so on. They always uh, will be much better if you manage separately in different directories. So don't try to use Terraform workspace inside of count simply because there will be a lot of uh, situations when readability of your code is much more important than saving two kilobytes of code. I mean, we are not paying for disk storage anymore. So it's much, much better to write more code, which is very easy to understand. And try to avoid dependencies in uh, modules so that one module uh, should not um, be using several layers of modules. It will be very hard to maintain and debug. So at most one, two levels is enough. So uh, as a small summary, uh, the main issue with Terraform 0.11 right now is uh, list, like the ways we have to work with list, especially on big structures, uh, can be a little bit tedious. So be careful with that one. And uh, try to use Terraform uh, and try to proceed Terraform easier so that you don't have to use all of these countless features which Terraform provides. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessary. You will have much easier life if you just write things much smaller and like don't use all features of Terraform at once. I see a lot of people try to use like, the read documentation and they try to use all parameters and workspaces and then code looks like spaghetti and they blame Terraform for that. So instead, just don't use half of features which Terraform provide and you'll have very easy to read code in uh, half year. So you may think, uh, what does it mean like for the future? Like why, why there is title? Uh, so Terraform 0.12 beta is out there. It will solve some of the problems related to list and few other syntaxes. Uh, sugar things like for example hcl2 is going to be simplified which means that uh, you, you're not going uh, to write all this double uh, double quotes dollar curly brackets uh, if you want to reference elements uh, and a few other things so the syntax will be just simplified that's really a good point uh, there will be different ways to loop. You can use for or you can use for each in order to, uh, to configure different properties of resources. And uh, finally, you can use correct conditional operator where left and right parts are not executed simultaneously as it was with 0.11. Actually, for me, it's bad side because now I have to test my code twice, uh, which means I have to make sure that I provide values uh, so that left part is executed, then I run code and see that everything was created fine. And then I have to make it so that right part is executed and run the same code twice. Uh, for me personally, as Terraform modules maintainer, this is a part of the problem. Extended type of variables, you can specify what kind of out uh, or input you expect. It can be list, string, maps, and so on. Template and values, you can link. Uh, between different resources so that modules can be now linked and much more is on this blog post it's uh, it was written approximately half year ago and it's still pretty relevant as i said terraform 0 12 uh, beta is there but uh, it will not fix your code it will be backward compatible with 0 11 uh, you can still use it you, you can even try to use it right now because it's available for download and you can run it on your dev and test environments. And uh, I also recommend to use uh, whatever existing you find is much better than just start to write Terraform after reading documentation. Because other people have made solutions for significant amount of workarounds, problems, and you will just get much more productive uh, if you read anything like uh, Terraform modules, which you find in registry, countless amount of utilities. Uh, I usually tweet about many of them on uh, my Twitter account, and uh, 
uh, yeah, I have a lot of them. Like, probably all of them uh, start on my GitHub profile because I like to see what the community is up to. In general, AWS has much better support than any other provider. Approximately 80% of tools, just of my rough estimate, is for AWS, while about 20% is for the rest in total, like Google, Azure. Um, so yeah, that's, I have bonus. I know that I have a little time, but I still have bonus, which is this one. So this is, you know, something like this, right? You probably saw something like this before, where you have, so Cloudcraft is a tool which allows to draw, uh, visualize your AWS infrastructure in the browser. So you can connect different components, you can specify different type of resources like auto scaling, EC2 instances, load balancers, and so on. And then you connect all of this yourself in the browser. You can also import your existing infrastructure uh, to be able to connect uh, elements and visualize them. Uh, you can also automatically update when something changes in your real infrastructure. And uh, approximately a year ago, I was looking like uh, we have AWS console where we uh, have been clicking historically for quite some time. And then we have tools like Cloudcraft where we visualize something. And then we have uh, Terraform where we describe everything as code. These three tools are not connected in a way that uh, we want them to be. Like uh, if we look uh, by job description, this is, let's call it random guy, is using this one. Okay, random guys, the going console, click everywhere. Let's call them random guys. This is uh, tools for cloud architects who are usually thinking about uh, different types of uh, resources, how to connect them, what kind of properties, instance size, open ports, uh, different solution architectures, and so on. And this is for DevOps engineers who are describing whatever they figure out as code so that it actually works. And uh, about half a year ago, I released, uh, or I actually released it earlier, but then I made it publicly available for everyone on Cloudcraft, where you design whatever you want, and uh, then you get use of building blocks of AWS infrastructure and save it as a Terraform configuration. So this is exactly what modules TF is for. I have some stickers here for those who want to get it. It's open source project. It's available for free for everyone to be able to generate your infrastructure as code from visual diagrams. So you go to you go to Cloudcraft CO. You can sign up or sign in uh, with free account. Uh, there are, this feature is available for free for everyone, and uh, you draw whatever you want to have, and then you click export, and the end result will be zip archive, which is potentially ready to use uh, for you right now. The thing is that uh, this code, which will be generated, is good starting point for people who want to get uh, uh, started with uh, with like enforced best practices. So code structure, different tools uh, like uh, modules, Terraform AWS modules, I mean, Terragrant, pre-commits, and a few other things uh, are automatically pre-installed for you. And the structure of the project is uh, the same as you visual, as you draw in the Cloudcraft UI. So if you specify that you want to have different instance type or different auto scaling and how they are connected. So if you specify that auto scaling group and application load balancer, security group, VPC are somehow connected, all of these relations will be taken into account and converted into Terragram. So which means that whatever your cloud architect has uh, been thinking about, you don't have to go and look into uh, diagrams again and think uh, what what do you mean here uh, whether we have to do this or not it will be one-to-one -one match this is ongoing process and uh, I'm gonna to invest more time on this one to make it much more complete because now I have some things hard-coded but uh, most of this uh, not most but actually everything of this you will have to uh, review and customize it for your needs uh, 
yeah, but it's potentially ready to use. And it's MIT license because you can just go there, fork it, or contribute. It's written in Python 3.6. It works on AWS uh, Lambda using serverless framework. Uh, yeah. So yeah, thanks. Anyone has question? Yep. Can you repeat? Yeah, that's a really good question about, uh, about uh, Terraform state. Terraform so, state. so quite uh, uh, quite obviously yeah, that uh, this is one of the pain points pain point for many people, many people that your that state file is not containing file all secrets which you which you didn't want to have in plain text. And uh, there are many different solutions how to do this. Like one of the most uh, popular one is uh, you don't have to give access to all developers in order to uh, read from this file. So you may have uh, centralized, uh, uh, let's say, Atlantis. Atlantis is a tool which uh, can be connected to your GitHub, GitLab, and since yesterday to Bitbucket as well. So you can connect it with your uh, repository and the developers from pull request will be able to write uh, Atlantis plan and Atlantis will execute Terraform on centralized place. So this means the developers uh, don't have to have access to the state file themselves. They still uh, will be able to read some of this if they provide some malicious code. So it can be, it has to be a little bit more secret than before. But uh, the other way is uh, if you split, um, like if you split uh, your one big state file, which contains everything and secret into at least two state files where secrets are used only when it's necessary, you'll be better to go than with having one big state file. For example, like there are many different ways uh, in AWS itself to manage, uh, to not use secret stuff, uh, which will end up in state file. For example, you can use IAM roles, you can use PGP encryption for uh, I am users, uh, access keys, and uh, you can use uh, different types of um, properties provided by the AWS provider itself. But uh, approximately, as I understand, about yeah, like in a month, maybe in two, there will be Terraform SaaS solution which will allow uh, allow people to not think about state problem anymore. So it will be fairly. Free. 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 Thanks everyone. Thanks.